Welcome to my home, from my home to your home. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I lost my wallet and my phone. They're together in one wallet. I looked everywhere. I could feel the panic growing as I retraced my steps to no avail. I had gone to pick up pizza for an elders meeting, and the meeting was about to start, but I was in such a state of panic that I told the elders, you know what, I'll be useless at this meeting until I find my phone. My life is in my phone. Ooh, that sounds so terrible, doesn't it? My ID, driver's license, health care, my finances, visa cards, all sorts of stuff, my calendar, my contacts, my pictures. I'll have to buy a new phone. I'll have to download all my information, if I can even find it. So I was angry when I thought about how much was wrapped up in that little gadget. You see, I'd parked to get pizza where the snow was loose and maybe six inches deep. And so it could be in the snow, frozen in time and unresponsive, or could be driven over or even worse, taken. Someone could be using the information and steal my identity. <clears throat> so in my panic, I thought of all the worst case scenarios. Someone with my visa card could do a lot of damage. So one elder called Royal Pizza and asked if they could look outside the restaurant. Another said, let's retrace your steps and I'll call the phone as we go. Finally, it's out to the truck that we go. This time I'm running. This is probably the last place that I can look for the phone until I now have to go to the pizza joint. Panic is high. I can hear it. Then I can't find it. But the anxiousness at least is receding. I finally found it. It was between the seat and the center console. Some people call this the abyss because you don't want to put your hand down there. It might be a dead mouse you come up with. It might be gum. It might be a loony or two. But, wow, I had found it. But you know what? There's something in our life that is far more valuable. And the tragic thing is that it too can be lost or stolen with far greater consequences. Now I'm talking about our identity, who we are, and who am I? Now the question of identity is a spiritual and yet a practical question. Because our inner life, that's our soul, our mind, our will, and emotions are driven by the answer to this important question. Who am I? Am I? Now, this is an important issue in our culture. I hear a lot of people talking about their identity, who they are, and how they want to be seen and addressed. The New York Times wrote an article called The Year We Obsessed About Our Identity. As a Western culture, we, so deep, we are so deeply concerned about how we are perceived. Would it strike you as odd to know that God too is deeply concerned about how we see ourselves and how we quantify our image and position? Now let me roll around another way. Identity is our sense of self and our sense of worth. It's at the core of who you are. Now we find ourselves in many different situations in life. We wear so many different hats and play so many different roles. You could be a mother, a grandmother, a daughter, a wife. You have workmates, you have a place you go to work. You could be a bowler on a bowling team. You could be a horse trainer, any number of things. And so to understand your identity, I would ask, what is the core that identifies you as you in all these varied situations in which you find yourself? You know, our identity is shaped by our culture, society, values, experiences that we have in life, our occupation, even our addictions, sexuality, our spirituality. Our identity is no small thing. Its influence and impact should not be underestimated. I don't think we give this the kind of attention, reflection, and meditation that our identity should warrant. 
what we've been talking about is how we see ourselves we really see ourselves through various lenses depending on which lens we pick we can fall into many dangers for example if you're looking through a cultural lens materialism is a big part of our culture what we own our house and cars if it's productivity which is really important in this culture we can so easily get squeezed into thinking that our identity is both our role and what we produce so what happens when we can't be productive maybe we lose our job or we lose our health then you could ask the question who am I now if your identity is wrapped up in your role as a mother or a father and your kids grow up and leave your home that's a good thing but if they take a wrong turn then you're devastated what's my worth now people can ask you know these things aren't bad but when they get your biggest part of your life and your identity is wrapped around them and it's walked away you're left bankrupt hollowed out and devastated we should then ask ourselves is this a worthy investment should this have occupied such a large part of my identity a healthy response would be to grieve that loss but say thanks be to God that there is more to me than the role I play more to me than the job I work at or the things that I accumulate you see God comes along and he says in Romans 12 2, he says don't conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good pleasing and perfect will this is the lens that he encourages us to look through when we are forming our identity in the message we're studying this weekend Paul speaks to the Ephesian Christians about his identity and out of his identity comes his calling and then his assignments let's look at the first point Paul states his identity in Ephesians 3 verse 1 he says I Paul the prisoner of Jesus Christ and again at the opening of this book Ephesians 1 1 he says Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ what he's saying he's saying at the core of who I am is Jesus Christ my identity is found in Jesus Christ whether you see me at work making tents eating in the town square preaching in the synagogue or at the lecture hall of Tyrannus I will be expressing the same message embedded deep in the core of my being it's about Jesus Christ you know what's unique about Christianity among all the other religions is that it's relational it's based on love and actually the Bible tells us that we are loved even before we establish a relationship with God but let me tell you once we establish a relationship with God and we ask him to be the Lord of our lives his love is able to flow into us because we've said yes and transformation takes place look at verse 2 he says there surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me now before Paul's conversion to Jesus Christ he was known as a persecutor of Christians the Bible says great fear rose across the land Paul was killing Christians he was destroying churches he was going from house to house dragging off both men and women and putting them in prison Paul's identity was changed by the love of Christ in short order on the Damascus Road when the Holy Spirit began to work then the Holy Spirit began to work refining him giving him a calling and various assignments from that point on you know I knew a man who started his life as a child of an unwed mother and no father in the picture at all then he was abandoned and unwanted until he was adopted so all his life he struggled with who he was 
He worked hard all his life to provide and be productive. His identity pushed him to be successful. He was an entertainer with his wife until the marriage broke down and he had to start again and now somehow managed, managed the family alone. Finally, he declared bankruptcy, which legitimized his assessment of himself as a failure. Late in life, actually at the age of 93, living in a senior's lodge, his health on the decline, the nurses made a call to the family. Your dad's not doing well. And it looks like his days are numbered. His daughter, who is a committed Christian, has prayed for him for years. And he would, that he would come to Christ and start living with a new identity. A few times she had talked to him about matters of his soul and spirit. But these talks went nowhere. Now more than ever, she felt prompted to share about the profound change Jesus Christ had made in her life. So she began by reading him the Father's love letter taken from words written by God to us in the Bible. And then she said, Dad, do you understand what God is saying here? How he sees you? And he answered, yes. Dad, do you understand the question at the end? Will you be my child? Yes, he said. Then she asked, will you believe in Jesus and receive him as your savior. And again, he said yes. And from that day, the man was changed. His health actually improved. And he was out of bed a couple of days later, interacting with people, laughing, singing, even dancing. And believe me, I know this man. This was not the same person. The nurses came and said to the daughter, Wow, your dad has really changed. You have made such a difference in him. He's so happy. And the daughter responded, oh, oh, no, no, no. It's not me. It's Jesus who has given him a new identity. And he's come to know the Father. He's never known his Father. And certainly never knew the love of a Father. So let me read the letter, the Father's love letter that was read to her dad that day. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up, I am familiar with all your ways. That's Psalm 139. Even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Jesus said that in Matthew 10. For you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You are not a mistake, for all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day that you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand. My plan is for your future and has always been filled with hope because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward, towards you are countless as the sand on the seashore and I rejoice over you with singing for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul and I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me, with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me, and I will give you desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you these, those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. 
When you are heart broken hearted, I am close to you. One day I would like to wipe every tear from your eyes. And I would like to take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your father. And I love you even as I love my son. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father and will always be father. And my question is, will you be my child? I'm waiting for you. Love your dad, almighty God. Paul is saying, that's my identity. If you asked, who are you, Paul? His answer would be, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. No matter what situation I find myself in, no matter who I am with, I will seek to represent Jesus. My calling is an outflow of my identity. That's the second point. And verse 7, Paul says this, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. The things that identify you will automatically flow from your life. Paul is so fulfilled, so filled that he needs to find expression. He needs to walk in his destiny. And he says, I'm a prisoner. I'm sitting in a cell. The worst place you could be, beaten, lacking food and confined. And as a servant, he would say, if this is where Jesus needs me to be, if this is where I can do his most effective work, I will serve him here. Serve him here. Not complaining, but writing letters of encouragement to churches. So there was a pivotal time in my life when I was evaluating my identity. I think we need to do this from time to time. You see, my identity was wrapped up, wrapped around myself. I wanted to be successful, uh, really to feed my own ego. I wanted to be rich, smarter than others, drive the nicest vehicle, hang out with the right people, have the right body image and hair. And one day I thought, oh, that's so shallow. It's so vulnerable, easily shaken when circumstances don't line up. I'm left really with an earthbound existence. I need to find a more worthy calling. And like Paul, I found Jesus and I adopted his calling. Now point number three, out of identity comes calling and out of calling comes assignment. Often people ask, how do I know what I'm to be doing in the kingdom of God? Paul said, his assignments came through revelation. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, Made known to me by revelation. Verse 5 says, Simply revealed by the Spirit. Now I have found that when I'm living and walking in my calling, that's when God speaks and reveals things to me, or the Holy Spirit begins to guide me and direct me. But I want to say this, if I'm not walking what he's called me to do, why would he reveal things to me? You see, when Paul came to faith in Jesus, his identity was changed. Remember his first calling? To be filled with the Spirit, and he asked for that. And what he did after he was filled with the Spirit was to follow God's second calling, and Paul was baptized. Third calling after that, he began to tell others about Jesus. 
God then began to reveal all sorts of things to him because he was following God's plan. And so it speaks to us, he speaks to us in the book of Acts and these 12 other books beside Ephesians. He talks to us about his assignment that God has given him. Paul's assignment, he speaks of it three times in these 13 verses of chapter 3. Take God's message to the Gentiles. All those who weren't Jews is what it means to be a Gentile. Verse 8, listen to this. This grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Yes, there are riches, boundless riches, in having our identity anchored in Jesus Christ and receiving His calling, revelation, and grace into our lives. To have Him then give us His assignments is incredible. I want to close with this story that happened this morning. I'm driving to the gym. It's 6.30 in the morning. I'm praying and I'm thanking God for His goodness and I'm actually feeling His joy pouring out from my identity, my walk with God. And when I get into the dressing room, here's my friend Peter and he's talking with a lawyer whom I only know to say hi. And he looks up from his talking and he said, looks at me and he says, why do you look so happy? And there was a moment of silence. I'm thinking, do I tell him the reason right here? Is this the place? Is this the time? It's on the tip of my tongue. I want to say it's Jesus. But my calling is to tell others. That's my assignment. But the Holy Spirit said to me in that moment, not now. There's a better time coming. And Peter, to break the silence, said, oh, he's always happy. There it is. That's my identity in Christ. There's my calling, and there's my assignment. Now, I want you to take a few moments with those who may be watching with you and discuss this question. Or if you're by yourself, take a moment and write it out. Uh, you'll find this included with the sermon insert. So I would encourage you to say, I am, let me fill it out, I am Al. My identity is, to, is in Jesus Christ. My calling is to tell the world. And my assignment comes in various ways. So like, just like Paul said, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, there's his, his identity. I'm called to take the gospel to the world. My assignment is to the Gentiles. So again, take a few moments to ponder these questions and then come back. Uh, let me pray for us that we might know our identity, that we might walk in our calling, and that we might know the assignments that God has given to us. So let me pray with you. Father, we thank you for your love and unmerited favor, grace in our lives. God, I pray that you would give us revelation and wisdom. May we know your peace and joy in this season. Uh, may we be strong in you, Lord, and walk in your mighty power. May we understand our identity and calling and assignment that you have for us. May we speak hope into, into the lives of people around us and be a blessing to one another and also to you. In Christ's name, amen. Now around here, we like to give blessings to one another. And I want to take this blessing from Ephesians, actually, in the same chapter. And it's right at the end of chapter 3. And we hold our hands like this and say, Lord, we want it all. Here's the blessing. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a good week.